Hey everybody, it's Pastor Don. Welcome to worship this week and happy Mother's Day to all of our moms who are out there. And we've got a couple of special things for you. But as we get started, I just wanted to remind you about a couple of things. We're still collecting food. You guys have done a great job. Um, we continue to help people like Bay Bayette Samaritan Center and other needs in our community. Um, you were just doing a bang up job uh, making that all happen. And we're continuing to have um, Zoom meetings for um, Bible studies, Sunday school, all that kind of thing. If you need help connecting, please let me know. You can email me at Pastor Don at Evergreen Church GA, and I would be happy to make sure that you get connected. Well, since it's Mother's Day, I'm not going to do a dad joke. Instead, I'm going to do a mom joke. So, what do you call a small mom? You're going to have to wait till the end to find out. I also want to read to you a, um, a poem, um, and I, I think this is a really great poem. Um, that is directed to moms. So give it a listen. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of their own mothers, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on those complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. Thank you. Our first hymn this morning is O Worship the King. This hymn was written in 1833 by a man named Robert Grant. Um, Robert's father had been the director of the East India Company. And because of his connections, Robert grew up in a world of power and politics and privilege. In the early 1800s, Robert became a member of parliament and worked closely with the royal power of that day. And one day he was studying Psalm 104, and he began comparing the greatness of God's royalty to the British monarchy, and he realized there really was no comparison between the two. And he wrote the words that would become a very powerful hymn, O Worship the King. And so, let's worship our King as we listen to this great old hymn of the church. O worship the King all glorious above and gratefully sing his wonderful love our shield and defender the ancient of days pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise oh tell of his might oh sing of his grace whose robe is the light Whose cannot be space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. 
Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. This morning, I want to just encourage you in your giving. Again, you are doing such a great job. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it's just awesome that we are able to support and encourage people in our community and around the world because of what you guys are up to. So, um, Evergreen, um, you're doing a great job. Just keep it up. This morning, I want to um, start with our scripture reading, um, which comes from the um, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. I'm actually in Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to read down through verse 17. Listen to the word of the Lord. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways of life, in the life that you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is now being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word, and we ask that by your Spirit, Um, you would speak to our spirits. Calm within us any voice other than your own so that hearing your voice, we would know that it is you and that we would um, not just hear it, but then we would then be inspired to go and do it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are in a series called Kingdom Living, and the whole point of this series is to take our understanding and knowledge about the kingdom of heaven, uh, the heaven, the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, and translate that knowledge into action. To become not just hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. What we want to do is we want to have our knowledge and understanding of the kingdom impact our everyday lives. Now, if you're new with us this morning, the background on all of this is the proclamation that Jesus made in in both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, early on in both those Gospels, and also in Luke and John, though it's stated a little bit differently, that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near us. Jesus proclaimed the coming of a new kingdom and a new ruler, and even after his resurrection, Jesus spent his time making sure that the disciples and those that he appeared to understood what the kingdom of God 
was. And he did this because he understood that these early church leaders would be the ambassadors for this new kingdom. You see, the kingdom is not just a a future event. It's not something that we're admitted to after we die. The kingdom is a new way of life, and it begins for every believer now. Now, this way of life is a powerful thing. It's, It's powerful enough to change a fisherman into a preacher. It's powerful enough to take a, a, a Jewish traditionalist and turn him into a, a Christian evangelist. It is powerful enough to transform those who have been lost into something they may have never been, which is found. This kingdom is available, and we live in it and for it right now. As believers, As the Bible puts it, we have actually become citizens of heaven. And this new reality, this new kingdom, really impacts everything. As citizens of this new kingdom, we are living a new way of life. And as we do so, we are transformed, as Paul says, by the renewing of our minds. And we are conforming more and more into the image of Jesus. And at the same time, leaving behind the ways of death the ways of the old kingdom, the patterns of this world. Jesus is absolutely central to this new kingdom. Because what has happened is this. When Jesus died, when he sacrificed himself, he removed our sin from us. You see, sin kept us separated from God. And sin itself, which is rebellion against God, shown by replacing God's idea of goodness with our own idea of good, That's what kept us out of the kingdom of heaven. But God's idea from the very start was to restore his original creation, a life and a world that is reflected in the kingdom of Eden. And to do that, sin and and death had to be dealt with. Sin had to be removed from us and its consequences, death as well. And it had to be done once and for all. And the only way to remove sin from humanity was to pay the blood price that it required. That's what it means that we are redeemed. It means that we have been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. It means that we are not our own, but that we belong body and soul to God. Now, our independence might get bruised just a little bit when we begin to consider that we are not our own and that we are owned by someone else, but living into the kingdom of heaven requires that we know who our Redeemer is and that we submit to His ownership of us, His Lordship over us. But before I get too far ahead of myself, would you pray with me? God, we ask that, um, that you would continue to open our minds to what you are saying, and that by your Spirit we would put off an old way of life and live into a new way of life, and not just for ourselves, but for the glory of the kingdom that you are bringing And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you might recall, um, we started this series talking about love. Because love is really the frame of the entire kingdom of God. Uh, Love is what sent Jesus into the world. Love is what sent Jesus to the cross. Love is who God is, and love is the foundation of every divine decision. And so it's no surprise, really, that the two areas that we've looked at so far, fear and money, that when we look at those, love is seen as the way that we deal with them. I mean, we deal with fear, for example, by owning the perfect love of God for us. You see, when, when we are perfectly loved, when we understand and we own that down to the, to the very tips of our toes, we understand that we have nothing to fear because the one who is not only the owner of the universe, but the creator of the universe is on our side and he is with us. And so that kind of knowledge, that kind of love chases fear out of our hearts, out of, our, out of the room, and out of our lives. Now, when it comes to money, money kingdom living is a, is a little bit different because what we have to do in that situation is understand our relationship with money. Again, sort of a, a love relationship 
We want to make sure that, that God stays in that love relationship and that money doesn't somehow sneak in and become the, the thing that we're relying on when we really should be relying on God. We want money to remain what it really is. It's just a tool to achieve God's kingdom results. This morning I'm shifting gears a little bit and I, I want to talk about relationships and I'm using the passage that I read to you a few minutes ago, Colossians 3, 1 through 17. But if you know me, you know this about me, I don't like passages that are just sort of lifted out of their context. I don't like them because sometimes they don't make good sense and they tend to get a little twisted when all the other surrounding arguments are left out. And I think this is a bad habit of the church, a bad habit of preachers for sure. And it's resulted in people not really understanding exactly what Jesus is saying or what is being asked of them as a citizen of heaven. So to live in the kingdom, we really have to be able to connect the dots. To be able to turn to the Bible for kingdom living guidance, we have to understand all it says, not just little snippets and pieces. For example, the passage that I read this morning um, begins with since then, which means that there is a whole argument that comes before what Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. And we'll come back to that in just a second. But, but first, I want to lay this groundwork for you. How we treat each other is the most obvious kingdom living activity that we perform every single day. Now, I don't think it's too much to say that if we can get our relationships right, a lot of other areas of kingdom living simply fall into place. I mean, filter what Jesus talks about through a relationship lens. Filter what Paul writes about or, or James or other writers of the New Testament. Filter the Ten Commandments through a relationship lens, and you begin to realize, you know what? A lot of this has to do with how we treat each other. I mean, look, when we're talking about do not murder, do not steal, um, don't lie, respect authority, those are all relationship issues. And let me also say that, that I don't know if you're like me, but when I hear someone say the word relationship, a lot of times where I automatically go is sort of a marriage relationship or a romantic relationship. And we are going to talk about that in a couple of weeks because how we behave in marriage, um, how we honor marriage is absolutely a place where we, we, we show kingdom living. But we have a lot of different relationships besides just marriage relationships and romantic relationships. I mean, we have, we have work relationships. We have um, relationships within the body of believers. We have relationships with people who are outside of the church. Uh, we, have, um, we have relationships with, with um, our, just our friends or our, our family. Every relationship that we have is really an opportunity um, for connection with another person, but it's also an opportunity for us to live into the kingdom. Now, I don't think it's hard for us to, to look at our own behavior or the behavior of someone else and, and say, well, that kind of behavior belongs in a new kingdom bucket or that behavior belongs in an old kingdom bucket. In this Colossians passage, Paul lists a number of things which which go into the old kingdom bucket. I mean, he starts with, with some kind of big things, um, things that well, we might not think ourselves too guilty of, but that's probably for another sermon another day. But he starts out with sexual immorality, lust, evil desires, and greed. And then he moves on to sort of more common old kingdom behavior, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language, lying. Those are more daily things, behavior that happens all the time. Now, we might generally excuse that in ourselves or in others. But what Paul is saying in essence is, is, look, these old kingdom ways, they don't fit you anymore. Because here's the thing, you've taken off your old self, you've put away your old citizenship, and you've now become someone different. You know, when I think about this, and I love this image, it's almost like what Paul is saying is, you know, suddenly you've become fit and healthy. Suddenly you dropped 30 pounds. And you know, you've got clothes, 
that you can still wear, but they just don't fit you anymore. They don't look good on you anymore. And so what Paul is saying is, is it's time to put those things aside and put on something else because your new citizenship is, is renewing you in the knowledge and the image of the one who created you. You are moving towards Eden. And the things which sort of plant you and define you as part of the old kingdom they got to go. I mean, even things that commonly divide people, um, Paul says they don't matter anymore. And and he's talking about ethnic divisions, um, Jews and Gentiles, status divisions like free or slave. These are all old ways, an old kingdom thinking. And for Paul, he says, you know, when you look at all that, forget it, because here's the thing. There's only Christ, and Christ is all and is in all. Now that takes me back to what Paul had to say before he launched into Colossians 3, and I can't go into a whole lot of detail um, because of time, but, but it is important to hit a couple of things, because these are Paul's reasons for putting off old ways and living into new ways. And the first thing that Paul says is that those of us who are in Christ are not who we once were. He tells the church, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies with him in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, through Christ, you are being presented as holy in the sight of God if you cling to the hope of the gospel. That is an incredible thing, that you are not who you once were. And so it makes sense, if I'm not who I once was, then new ways of being, new ways of thinking, new ways of living have got to be part of my experience. We've, we know this, right? We've been talking about this. And the second thing that, that Paul says is that, that as we received Christ as Lord, we also now live in him and root ourselves in him. And so what Paul is saying here is when when we became subjects of this new kingdom, when we accepted the lordship of Christ over ourselves, what we also began to do is look towards him and and understand, well, how how did he live? How did he love? Where did he go? See, Everything that we do in a circumstance like that is shaped by the example of the king. This is really important because I think that a lot of times what happens is we start following Jesus and what we do is we take a list of things not to do, kind of like Paul's list that I just went through, and then we try really hard in our own power not to do those things. We want to do better, right? But then we find that we can't. We're, we're failing constantly, and we're trying. Sometimes we're trying very hard, but what we're trying to do is live out new kingdom values out of an old kingdom mindset, when what we actually have to do is live in Christ and be rooted and grow out of him. We have to change our mindset We have to look in a different direction. In fact, we have to start from a different direction in order to look in a new direction. See, instead of being a better version of our old selves, that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is become an image bearer of Jesus. We work to become like him, not just a better us. And then you come to Colossians 2, uh, verse 10, where it says this that we are complete in Christ. Now, your translation may, something, may say something like, in Christ you've been brought to fullness, but the language really lends itself to completeness and wholeness. And so when Paul says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is, when he says, set your mind not on things, on, on earthly things, but things in heaven, when he, when he says, put off your old kingdom ways, Paul isn't saying to us, look, you have to be good or you have to try harder. What he's saying is is that in Christ, you are complete. There is nothing more to add when you are in Christ. See, Christ is how you take on life in the new kingdom. It's by focusing on him and watching him. In fact, 
focusing on Christ, being complete in Christ, is how you get rid of your old kingdom ways as well. Because you cannot focus on Christ and continue in your old kingdom habits where your heart was set on money or status, self-fulfillment, pleasure, being right, being angry, bashing people that you disagree with and deepening divides. You see, setting your eyes on Jesus changes us. It transforms us. It allows the the reality of God entering into our human kingdom in order to save us. That becomes our defining point. It becomes the filter through which we make all of our decisions and take all of our actions. See, it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Because in Jesus, we are complete. And so if you're complete in Jesus, I mean whole, there is no more searching for your own fulfillment. There is no chasing after your own status. There's no possibility of of earning love through performance because you're already complete in Christ. You see, since then you have been raised with Christ. Since you are complete in Christ, you can treat other people with humility and justice. Because you know what? You don't need anything from them. You can love them fully because you already have everything that you need because you're complete in Christ. And being right, winning, getting your way, storing up treasures on earth, whatever those treasures might look like or whatever form they take, it's just not even necessary anymore. Not when you're already complete in Christ. Which is why Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, put on like a coat, choose Ways of living that that fall into the new kingdom bucket. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Forgive those who you have a grievance against. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of those things, put on love. The one thing that defines all kingdom living. The one thing that binds everything together in unity. Oh, and here's a secret. Do you know what kingdom living brings people? It's something that that almost everybody is searching for and very few of us actually find. Peace. That's what Paul says. That when you actually put on kingdom living, when you hold Christ up here and understand that he's got it, he's king, he's in control, that no longer do you need to be anxious or afraid. I mean, if there's a wrong to be addressed or fixed, the king will fix it. If you have a need, the king will provide it. If you feel as though you're less than you ought to be or less than you want to be, you're not because you're complete in him. You see, that's the kingdom. That's what the kingdom looks like, and that's what the kingdom feels like. And the key is Jesus. As I pile up more and more life experience, which is a euphemistic way of saying as I get old, the one thing I want people to know who are coming up behind me is this. All your frustration about things not being the way that you think they should be, all your disappointment, over who you think you should be and you don't think you are, all those things that spill over into anger and and malice and slander, all the ways that you have lied in big ways and small ways to make yourself look better than you actually are, all the ways that you have chosen you over other people, I mean, even if those other people really didn't deserve your love or your attention, all the times that you have chosen to, um, to hold a grudge because somehow you thought that justice would be served by you holding hatred against someone else in your heart, all of those things are actually keeping you out of the kingdom of God. They are keeping you away from what you actually want. 
And now I could say, well, just let it go. I mean, just don't do it anymore. Make better choices. Lose the habits of a lifetime. But the truth is, to treat people right, to live into the kingdom, is not about improving ourselves. Because we've tried that and it didn't work. The only thing that works is getting our eyes on Jesus and letting go of any thought or fantasy that we are the judge and jury of this world, that we have been somehow ordained the manager of the universe. Because we are not our own saviors, and we're not anybody else's savior either. It's Jesus. It always has been, and it always will be. And so what do we do? We point to him over and over and over again. We point to him in word and in deed. We live into the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, and we show people by our way of life and by our way of love that we are citizens of a new land and a new kingdom now. We reflect the love of the king, a love that gave himself for other people, and we love the way that he loved by giving ourselves away. We do, as as Paul says towards the end of that passage in Colossians, whatever we do, whether we speak it or whether we do it, whether it's an action, we do it all in the name of Jesus, meaning reflecting the new kingdom. And we give thanks to God the Father through him because he has opened the way. Would you pray with me? God, there are times when your kingdom seems so close, and there are times when your kingdom seems so far. And it is hard for us to live between these two extremes. And so would you convince us by your Spirit that putting off our old ways is worth it, that we won't lose a single thing by putting off our our anger or our hatred or our malice or our slander, and that we will gain everything by living into humility and patience, and gentleness, and kindness. Father, you know that we just got kind of twisted up between these two kingdoms. And I just pray that by your Spirit, for myself and and for others, that we would just let go and understand how perfectly loved we are so that we would not fear moving from one place into another, leaving the old behind in favor of the new. Lord, for every single time that, that we have treated someone as less than we should have, because we are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and we want to reflect that, we ask for your forgiveness. And we ask, Lord, that the next time that those old kingdom ways rear up in us, that you would cause us to take a breath and think about whose we are and where we belong. Thank you for loving us so much. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, our... um, our second hymn today is, O oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. This, this second hymn is important because it reflects a time in the hymn writer's life, um, a man named Washington Gladden, when a lot of people turned away from him um, and what he was teaching. Um, Washington was a pastor in the years after the Civil War, and he was a champion of undoing a lot of the injustice that he saw in the world at that time. And as anybody who has ever kind of gotten really in there, in the trenches, in the kingdom trenches, you know 
that sometimes it's really hard and you feel really alone. And this hymn points to the fact that sometimes the only thing that we can really do in order to live out the kingdom is to focus our walk on Jesus. So let's worship together with, O Master, let me walk with Thee. O Master, let me walk with Thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winning word of love. Teach me the wayward feet to stay and guide them in the homeward way. Teach me thy patience still with me in closer, clearer company in work that keeps faith sweet and strong in trust that triumphs over wrong, in hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way, in peace that only thou canst give with thee, O Master. Again, thanks for being with us um, on this Mother's Day for worship. We have um, a, a special video that we'd like to show you. Um, it is in honor of all of our moms. And so if you just take a look, um, we love you, Evergreen. And so take a look at this video. Thanks again to all of our moms who are out there. You know, um, before I end, I, I can't forget, I got to tell you the answer to my mom joke, right? So what do you call a small mom? Well, I think it's obvious, right? A minimum. You get it? You have to think about that one. Hey, Evergreen, as we go, um, wherever you're going, um, wherever God takes you, um, remember that you are an ambassador to the kingdom. How you treat other people really matters because they really are watching you, wanting to know what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? What does it mean to have been saved by Jesus and brought into this new way of life? And so treat other people with humility and, and respect and, and most of all, love. And so go out and love your neighbors and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and in you, both now and forever. Amen. We've got one more song for you to end our worship service. Um, this week's, our last song, is it's called Canvas and Clay, uh, Canvas and the Clay. This song is by um, Pat Barrett, and it weaves together, I think, some really cherished thoughts about God. The first um, being that the, from the moment that we were conceived, we were loved by God. That's a beautiful thought. And that 
um, and the other thought is, is that as a result, God is always guiding us. Um, God never leaves us, and nothing is wasted. No positive experience or negative experience. Um, that all of those things are being used by God, the great artist, to create who we are. So I hope you find inspiration and encouragement in that. Remember how much we love you. If you need a single thing, please get hold of us and have a great week. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully you're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. Cause you make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name there's a healing light just beyond the clouds though I walk through When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm a canvas and clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm a canvas and the clay. And when I doubt it, Lord, remind me. been wasted no failure or mistake you're an artist and a potter I'm a canvas and a clay so you're not finished cause you're not finished with me you're not
Cause you make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together and for your glory and for.